my name is Bill Thompson. I'm a, <coughs> a hack and a pundit and a friend of web science. Um, that's probably all you really need to know about me. Uh, I do this sort of stuff. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome all of you in the flesh space of Norton Rose Film Rights offices and also those of you who are watching online. Thank you for being here. I hope we can make it worthwhile spending an hour of your time with us. We have an esteemed, a distinguished panel. Uh, we managed to marshal them into their seats, but only just because they're those sort of independent thinkers. Uh, including Professor Dame Wendy Hall, who's Managing Director of the Web Science Trust and a very noted computer scientist. Professor Nigel Shadbolt, Chair of the Open Data Institute, Director of the Web Science Trust and Principal of Jesus College, Oxford. Doc Searles, a fellow journalist, blogger, author of Clue Train, and the director of Project VRM at the Berkman Klein Center for the Internet and Society at Harvard. Liz Brandt, who is the CEO of Control Shift, which delivers trusted information services. And Matt McNeil, who is currently head of Google Cloud Platform, but has a very distinguished career as a computer scientist himself. This is a very timely uh, debate, uh, talking about trust in the web. Back in the 1980s and 90s, we, I think many of us here, were fighting the first crypto wars against Bill Clinton and the clipper chip. And users of Phil Zimmerman's Pretty Good Privacy would organize key signing parties where we'd come together to establish what we called a web of trust based around our public key being, sent, being signed by other people in our physical presence, an attempt to avoid central authority and root certificates and things like that, and grounded reliance on strong cryptography in the physical world and in actual meetings. It was a radical thing to do. Today, we face the challenge of fake news, or propaganda, as I prefer to call it, <laughs> And it seems to be the latest nail to be hammered into the coffin of mainstream media, despite the fact that the corpse is still protesting, Monty Python style, that it's not dead yet. <laughs> <laughs> and so here we are to discuss trust and the web in the context of web science and our deepening appreciation of the web's enormous ability to amplify human cognition and to engage us socially as people in a shared community. What I'm going to do is ask each panellist in turn to spend three to five minutes sharing their insights. Then we'll engage them in a guided debate before opening up to all of you for the second part of the discussion. When I do open up, there'll be microphones coming around, so please wait for the microphone so you can be heard around the interwebs. And also, I don't just expect questions, because many of you are equally qualified to be sitting here on the panel as the five people we've got here now. So if you do want to make a point, please keep it succinct, and please let me know it's a point so we're not all anxiously hanging around for the question that you've inserted at the end to justify having stood up in the first place. <laughs> we're perfectly happy to hear your intelligent contributions to the debate without having to point them at one or t'other of the panellists. We'll be finishing at 13.35, and I mean at 13.35, because I'm a radio journalist and I know how to come out on time. <laughs> so with that in mind, I'm going to start by asking Wendy to talk to us about social media. Oh, thanks, Bill. I want to say thank you to Marcus and Norton Rose for hosting us here in London, and thanks for everyone who's come on the panel, and particularly Bill, a um, uh, star of radio, TV and radio, um, to chair us. So, trust in the web. Bill Hart, back to the early days. I remember the res resistance to the web in the early 90s, and many people used trust in the information that was on the web as the reason why they thought it was rubbish. Because it was the early days, there was very little on there. I remember in the academic world, people said, well, there's most of the stuff our students want to know isn't on the web, so how can we use it? Um, uh, and, and at the beginning of Wikipedia, um, people just rubbished it because there was nothing there. You know, how could you, uh, how could you trust the information? Um, and now we see how the collective intelligence that this whole ecosystem has inspired works in Wikipedia, and it's still working through. And you know, it's only been 14 years since we've had Wikipedia. Um, it was based on an earlier online encyclopedia, but you know, it's it's all very new. And just imagine if Wikipedia disappeared tomorrow. I mean, what would we do? But so here we are today in the age of social networks, the mobile web. People are tweeting. I hope you're all tweeting. Hash web website 10 mm -hmm. um, and uh, 
uh, we're talking to the world on this thing called the internet, um, and use YouTube, which is another creature of this whole system. Um, and so we're using these social networks all the time. And they, you know, we've had, we talk of trolls and bot, bots, and the question is, who and what can we trust in these systems? And they're evolving as we, as we talk here today. The, um, the big news, of course, is what's happened in the, um, the poll. The, the Brexit uh, uh, referendum and the US elections, the polls were so desperately wrong. But all our, the work that we have, and there's a blog and a press release today about the work that we've been doing, uh, Southampton, uh, Renzo Polytechnic, as people at Oxford, the OAI, uh, University of Southern California, the analysis of the, the tweets from the, these uh, elections were that the social media is a much better predictor of what's going to happen than the polls. The social media, the conversations predicted uh, Brexit and predicted a Trump victory when the polls were saying the opposite. Um, none of us really understand why that is. And the trouble with the world we're in is that if we did understand it, then behavior would change and the system will change. I mean, this is the, you know, if people know, we're already picking up that the Trump campaign look, used a lot of bots, right? But if people know that their, their conversation is being monitored, well, they might change the type of conversation. So this is, this is why web science is so important. Three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, so web science is important because it can give us a way to understand what we should and shouldn't trust or to measure trust? I think the key thing about web science is it's the interdisciplinary study and that, that actually there's a quantum effect in web science because if, it, because if, if, you, if people know you're observing them, they'll change their behaviour. Uh, so, um, and it's all about human behaviour meets this amazing technology. Actually, I think what we should have called web science is the science of interconnectivity. Because that's what it's about. It's how machines, people, and then the, the millions of devices that are going to come on, these dumb devices through which smart cities are going to happen. That's my nightmare world. And that's why this, this interdisciplinary work is so important. So we can have the internet of trusted things in a few years' time. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like the optimism. Um, Nigel, can I turn to you now for your, yeah. your, your reflections on trusting trust? Well, actually, just the reflection on the websites. We, we had lots of arguments about what we wanted to kind of uh, call this thing that we were trying to call, call, into, call attention to, from philosophical engineering to nexalism. Uh, those science fictionaries in the audience, check out nexalism. Um, it's... Uh, essentially about connection. It's about connecting knowledge, as Wendy's been saying. And, of course, in the work that has um, been ongoing in the last uh, 10 years, um, yeah, that interdisciplinary mix, it is still the case that we work hard and need to strive harder to get mixed methods, qualitative and quantitative, to sit well in the same and, and play nicely together. That we need to kind of understand and respect each other's kind of disciplinary boundaries whilst understanding where they can really bring insight into the web. I think the thing that's struck me, of course, what's happened in my, in my own journey through web science is, is, is a kind of an interesting, well, not a diversion, a very mainstream activity around the open data agenda. Now, that whole issue about using the web, the web of linked data, as we refer to it, you know, stripping away all the uh, uh, fangled stuff about the semantic web and stripping it down to a basic idea of, 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 of web dereferenceable data that could connect and link. Once you put that out there at scale, you see new behaviours. As you say, everything from uh, house prices uh, being affected by uh, cr crime reports to hospital infection rates uh, being driven down by league tables. Fantastic social event uh, effects, issues around transparency and accountability, but really serious issues around trust. Um, and I think the issue about trust is that... Um, now we're becoming more successful in promoting and promulgating the, the, the whole area of open data. People are saying, well, well, how do we know its provenance? How do we know its quality? Shouldn't we trust the national statistics better? Um, all this pre-release stuff. Um, does scruffy work? Does imprecise data work? And our view is that actually getting eyeballs on it at scale, which is the genius of the web, humanity connected, is a thing that can drive up the quality of good data. It can also flood the world with crummy data, false data, misinformation. 
Uh, but that's always been the case. In a sense, the history of the web and technology, it's a dual-use technology. And just like every other technology, it has a, a dark side and a light side. It has different, it reflects human behavior. And we will weaponize the web in the same way we've weaponized every other technology. The trick is, can we keep the values that we cherish of openness, universality and, universality and accessibility going? And that's a huge challenge. Uh, one, just to give you one idea on that with the open data, one thing as we talk about trying to make this data part of our national infrastructure, what happens if you get a denial of service attack on the very service that is giving all the information about your legally constituted companies or the administrative geography of your country? There will be real issues. I've just been belled out. You didn't bell yourself out. That's right. <laughs> but actually, um, uh, that... <laughs> That is a material question. How do we trust the data itself? Um, and I'm sure we'll segue into issues around the issue around not just open data, but personal data trust around that whole space too. Thank you. Uh, Wendy was defeated by the iOS 10 user interface, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Few mortals have ever been able to fathom it. Did you start that at three minutes? Three minutes you had. So <laughs> would you then argue that there's something within sort of the, the trusted web that is, is, is fundamentally an expression of enlightenment values? Because that's what you seem to be skirting around. Yeah, I would. I w in fact, I, I think there's a, um, it's a term uh, I, 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 a number of people have been using, but I, I really like to kind of um, embrace and promote, which is the idea of the digital enlightenment. At this moment of endarkenment, the question about the original enlightenment was about trying to take on um, bigotry and intolerance to actually try and use ra reason and rational principles to, uh, to advance um, the cause of individuals and societies in the face of authority and tyranny. And I think that's a great place to start. And I think the web so construed, a digital enlightenment, is exactly what we should be calling out. Thank you. I'm going to move now to, to Doc Searles, a man whose writing I've read, enjoyed, respected, disagreed with, agreed with for many years. Um, and you're going to take a more historic perspective, I think. Right. Um, the web we know uh, that was invented earlier um, took its current form on April 30th, 1995. That was when something called the NSF net shut down or basically took itself off. Up to that point, that was the only backbone within the internet of the time that forbade one kind of traffic. It was commercial traffic. And that meant that the web and the net could be commercial for the first time. Now, the significance of this isn't just that commercial activity was allowed on it, which allowed an, an explosion of activity that wasn't possible before, but that any form of content that ha had been forbade at all. We had, finally, the network that it was designed to be in the first place. The, the, uh, the Internet Protocol uh, and TCP IP is profoundly simple and gave us this amazing grace that is the the internet that we now know. This is one where it's designed on what's called an end-to-end -end principle. That means all the intelligence is at the ends. And the whole purpose of the internet is just, it's just a protocol that says a best effort will be made over any path in the middle to connect any two points in the world. No billing is in this, no control. We, we call neutrality, but basically it's an oblivity on the part of the networks inside the internet to whatever content passes between endpoints. And what this has had the effect of doing is making what one fellow that I know calls a giant empty sphere. The emptiness in the middle is the internet. The sphere itself is the people and things on it. Um, and he calls this a giant zero. And uh, David Eisenberg, who's another authority on this, calls it a stupid network on purpose. It's stupid in the middle and smart at the edges. We're the smart ones at the edges. It has created something entirely new to human experience, which is it has put all of us on it a distance apart, a functional distance apart, of zero. We have be barely begun to cope with this, of what this means. All is permitted, and we're all zero distance apart. We're used to being in a, in a room like this where I can yell, you know, and the inverse square law applies. My, my voice is going to fade toward the back of the room. We don't have that on the internet. All of us can be heard by anybody. Everything can be connected. So my point there is it's still early, and we've barely begun to terraform this second virtual world that we created next to the first one, which is a, a physical space. The second is we created a kind of Eden here. And just like the natural Eden, it didn't come with privacy. We're all naked here. And what can be done with technology will be done with technology. That's just the way technologists work. 
And we didn't invent clothing and privacy, uh, uh, clothing and shelter. We're all wearing privacy technologies here. Privacy is a, f is, is a done thing in the physical world. It's not done in the virtual world yet. In fact, we've barely started. And the one thing I want to make clear is we will not fix it unless we, as individuals, are the first parties and not the second parties. When industry won the Industrial Revolution 150 years ago, they needed to be able to scale. Big companies, big industries, governments needed to be able to scale. They would give people identities, they would tell people how to do things. We created things called contracts of adhesion. Every time you see something that says, please accept our terms and conditions, you are always the second party and you're always the subordinate party. The internet was created to overcome that, to overthrow that system. We can only overthrow it if we are the first parties, and that's really the frontier here, and that's what's going to create the trust. Oh. Thank you very much for that. So Welcome. Are you actually optimistic that privacy can be retrofitted onto this technology, or do we need to do something more radical? I don't think it's retrofit. I think we have to fit it in the first place. I think we, the, the browser should have had um, first party terms built into it in the first place. I mean, with HTTP headers and so forth, here's, our, here's my permission for the use of my data. Right. Haven't had that. We're starting to do that now. But I don't see it as retrofitting. We're just out, we're, we're civilizing this place for the first time. Right. Mm. Thank you for that. Welcome. <clears throat> One of the issues that, that raises, of course, is that many companies, many businesses rely on the lack of privacy in order to establish a relationship. Well, too bad for them. Well, I we're we're going to fix that. We're going to fix it. Well, I think we have to. Liz, who I'm going to turn to next uh, from Control Shift, may have some thoughts about how it can be fixed and how trust is established. Yes, thanks very much. So we, we are a strategic consultancy and we work with businesses all over the world. And this issue has and is a big issue for businesses' trust. And we've been working with the World Economic Forum and regulators and legislators and in fact, I met Nigel first time when we were working on the My Data program. This has been an issue for over eight years, and we've been working on it with those businesses. Um, and the thing that I observe is that actually uh, an individual, an individual company, an individual government department, an individual legislator, an individual government can't do it alone. And actually, we need to bring together, we need to have a new relationship between businesses, government and consumers to be able to make this work. We cannot do it by running at it from one angle alone. It, it's, it's a story of our time, this. You know, basically, <clears throat> the web has created amazing opportunities and we've got virtual reality coming and we've got augmented reality and we've got uh, connected cars, connected everything coming our way. And, and all of that has outpaced what we actually can cope with in our political and social environments. We can't, our social norms are broken for it. Our education isn't ready for it. Our communities aren't ready for it. Our workplace, commerce and e-commerce, they're just not, and our economic systems aren't ready for it. And, and our politicians aren't ready for it. And neither are our legislators or anybody that's trying to put trade agreements together. They're just not ready for it. We need to bring all that together to make this stuff work. And, and all that means that right now, and this plays back to Wendy's point, People are being left behind, you know? People can't cope with that pace, and I think that's what we're hearing in Brexit and Trump and all those things that are going on around the world. They just cannot keep up with it, and they're basically kicking back. Um, and not kicking back like we're kicking back, but kicking back just, just how, they can, how they can in their, in their own way. <clears throat> and, and all this is going at a great rate of knots, which is why we can't do it as we used to. And just, you know, legislators do something, they bash businesses, businesses then come back and bash legislators, and then the consumer might call it, oh, they can't carry on like that. You know, we've got, our, our digital economy is growing massively all over the world, and economies are really depending on that growth. The UK digital economy is worth 8.7%. Last year, the digital economy accounted for 40% of the UK growth. 40% of our growth. Right now, people don't trust it. They don't trust what's going on. And, and that is going to put the complete mockers on our digital growth. So we've really got to do something about, um, about all that. And you know, we, we've got the Internet of Things coming up. It's now it's, it's time. Yeah? We've got 16.4 billion connected things. And people are predicting by 2020, 20.8 20 billion things connected. You know, we're, we are growing at a rapid rate of knots. But you know, these things belong to people mostly. There are homes, there are cars, there are things in our shoes, in our phones, everywhere and everywhere, and people don't trust it. You know, what are we going to do with that data? Who's doing what with it? So, um, 
In the meantime, we've got another thing going on over here, which is business models are being eroded. You know, everything is being crunched down. Commodities are, you know, commoditized business models are just eroding and eroding, and margins are disappearing. Businesses are seeking and seeking and seeking new opportunities to drive growth, and they see this as their opportunity. And, and, new, and, new, and the old barriers are breaking down by things like General Data Protection Regulation and PS, uh, Payment Systems Directive too. So all of that is breaking down barriers that are for entry for businesses. Consumers are changing, and we've all seen that. You know, consumers are they're, they're looking for a better life, but actually they're kind of more aware of what's going on with their data. Um, their, their trust is being eroded. Consumers can now have a voice and have a choice, and they're up and outing all the time. Um, interesting to see today that EMEA uh, published uh, something from their loyalty lens, which says, if you hold consumers' data, not only are they expecting you to, to um, manage it effectively, but now they're expecting higher customer service. So they're really starting to understand their pressure is on, and consumers are putting it on. So... Um, what is it to be done? Not just consumer opinion, obviously, not just better internet of things, not just better experiences or better value propositions for businesses and, and consumers. Sorry, individuals. That's we know we don't talk about consumers. I'll let it go. Um, not, not just information sharing relationships, not just any one of those things, but all of those things. That's what needs to be tackled, and all of that needs to be brought into, into focus across our lives, across business legislation, regulation, and, and consumer lives. So that's where I see trust in the web needing to focus, and I'm hoping that as a web science group that you can really help and benefit this growth in our digital economy. Thank, thank you for that. It, it, one reading of what you're saying is that, that just as sort of government and regulations underpins the, the financial system, they need to underpin a, a trust system in, in a similar sort of way. It's, it's that big and that important. <clears throat> Completely. I mean, we've just finished a piece of work with Facebook, um, and we, we've engaged with over 150 leading thinkers around the world. And, and the general sense is that legislation absolutely has to play its part, but it has to play a part in a very informed way. So what's happening is legislators are slightly behind the curve. I'm shocked to hear that. I know. And, 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 but actually, there's so many of us that actually can help bring, bring to reality what, what they're trying to legislate. So, you know, trying to bin those together and create that new relationship is absolutely key. Thank you, I, I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll come back to that. After we've heard from Matt McNeil from uh, Google Cloud Services, who's going to give us a bit of context there about one of the providers of the systems we all need to trust. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, uh, and it's great to be here, actually, um, uh, you know, discussing web science and, and its implications. Um, I should probably give you a little bit of context, actually. Um, someone once described sort of working with Google can be a bit like an octopus in a string bag. It's, it's involved in so many different things. And uh, certainly sitting, sitting on a panel, you know, it's been known that I've had questions about self-driving cars and robotic dogs and various other things. <laughs> but what I'd like to do is maybe just sort of give you a sense of what I have been working on for the last four or five years. And, and that is um, it's something that we now call Google Cloud Platform, but it's been an initiative to externalize the technology platforms, the data platforms, machine learning platforms, and compute platforms, which underpin Google. Um, and that's quite, an, it's been quite an interesting journey, actually. I was in, involved basically sitting in a room with 20 people when it was a twinkle in a product manager's eye about uh, sort of four or five years ago. Uh, and, and it's now grown to probably one of the biggest initiatives in the company. Um, and the reason for that is that over the last 18 years, we've actually learned an awful lot about how you implement the technological systems, um, which really, I suppose, as you say, a lot of the web today relies upon, whether that's Google Search, whether that's Gmail, um, uses of Calendar, or, or any of the other Google services. Um, one of the things that really, I think, has sat at the bottom of this, and, and really has, has been, I think, one of the key areas of interest from our partners as, and, and customers as we started making these things available, it, is that over those 18 years, um, we've had a core principle that has been recognized at the center of the company, that the web works on, on, on trust. You know, trust is absolutely crucial. And as probably uh, one of the first really big, large-scale data companies, this recognition of the relationship with our customers was very, very important. And that led to the way that we've developed our technology over that, over that period, having this kind of principle, not just in the technology, but in the culture of the company. 
um, in the way that we think about the care of our, uh, of, of our data and our customers' data. So we're very famous, I suppose, um, in tech circles for, I suppose, some of the research about 10 or 15 years ago that gave rise to things like big data, some of the papers that we published in the research, which led to things like Hadoop, et cetera, which are some of the big technologies in this space. Um, but I'd say one of the things that has really um, become embedded is that we care for this data at every level. So we are able to audit and see exactly who has accessed, in what way, any piece of data. So every single element of data is secured and permissioned individually. And that really has been a founding principle which allows us to remain accountable to our customers, to be able to provide them with the transparency information that they need in order to run their businesses. Now, what's been interesting over the last sort of two or three years as we've been um, really engaging with industrial partners and exposing some of the work that we've been doing is it's in these areas where actually things are quite highly regulated that the most I interest has arisen. So things like financial services, where the whole industry is now being shaped by regulatory, um, regulatory change, really, in response to what happened in 2008. And that, that is actually a place where I think you, you see, uh, as we were speaking about before, Liz was saying, that this combination of really the, the political sphere, the regulatory, the government, and business starting to come together in, in what is quite a, quite a lot of tension, to be honest, if you're within that industry, you'd recognize it. It is completely reshaping the industry. But I, I think this is going to happen more broadly across many industries. So, you know, starting to think about really the implications of this is becoming crucially important. And, and I think, you know, just to sort of take one step back from this, this is not a purely technical problem. It's a cultural problem. Um, I think it was Plato who says that, you know, a people get the government they deserve. And, and uh -oh. you know, what... <laughs> and, Be fine. Well, you know, it's... But, it, but it, what, it, what it says is that, you know, you, you don't get anything for free, really, without responsibilities. So where you have these capabilities, and they are becoming democratised, you know, people, you, you do get startups. I'm working with... Uh, Tom, who, who's here today and is going to tell you about Z21, but this sort of uh, ability to really allow small innovators, entrepreneurs to come, come up and start really using this cutting-edge technology at pretty much whatever scale, that's here today. That's already here. So the, what comes along with this is also a sort of a cultural recognition of the responsibility that goes with being able to use the tools and techniques that are available. Uh, and, you know, that really is a social question for all of us. Um, and it is one where I think regulatory, government, um, business, and us as individuals all play, have to play a part. And that's why, ultimately, I think, you know, this aspect of culture is crucial. Thank, thank you, Matt. And picking up on that, mm. the, obviously, sort of, we're here to celebrate web science. Where do you see the insights that come from a better understanding of the web as a social machine? feeding into the work you're doing mm. trying to build mm. technologies and systems which will implement mm. trust yes uh, so i mean at one level it's about making sure you've got that transparency and control auditability right at its base but i think the the question really goes much beyond that and and this is where i think um you know where there, there is that innovation and entrepreneurship happening that it's not happening in a vacuum away from that that, um, that accountability that needs to be there. You know, if you've got a customer who's building a system touching a billion people, yep. you, know, you, you know, you have a responsibility to make sure they've got the tools and the systems to be able to do that as, responsibility, as responsible as they can. Okay. Um, and, and really democratizing that capability. Th thank you. And, and thank you all for, for, for your insights and your different perspectives. It feels to me, listening to, to what everyone's had to say now, uh, and in the context of, of 10 years of web science, that I go around telling people that the digital revolution has already happened. It's been and gone. If you talk about the forthcoming digital revolution, you missed it, and you're probably already lost everything. But we all know there's another revolution coming, and that's the machine learning, if you like, revolution 2.5, that, that as we begin to deploy advanced machine learning techniques, we're going to see even bigger impact on the way industrial society operates, assuming we manage to avoid the uh, impacts of climate change. 
Is there a need, I would ask all of you, and I'll start with Wendy, for a trust revolution to happen first? The, the, the necessary grounding of holding it all together in future is that we do trust a lot better. Well, I don't know about the revolution's got to happen first. I think um, uh, these things are going to happen uh, uh, simultaneously because I think there is a... We were talking at... No, in the minibus on the way up yesterday about this. Um, and how um, th there is a, a growing um, sense of mistrust of what people, that what organizations, that's both governments and companies, are doing with our data. Um, uh, the Snowd Snowden made us think about mass surveillance um, and all the issues um, coming out about what Facebook are and aren't doing with the news and what Google, I'll say what Apple does with my music by putting it into the cloud. Oh, that really annoys me. Um, it's saving you from those easy listening CDs. <laughs> it's like... We're forcing them on you. <laughs> it's like, what happened to my music that I, yeah, bought on a CD? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Right. So, um... <laughs> So I think there is a movement, and I, I, I think what's happened, that this is all tied up with the time, the timing of the idea of the, the, the popular, popularism in elections. We're going to see this happening in Europe, um, and I think... Elsewhere that, in Europe. Elsewhere. Well, <laughs> yes, we're still there. Uh, and, um, and, and I think there, there is a growing realisation we need to do something differently, and I think Doc's point uh, that... that, that we, what did you say? People have to become the first party in the contract is where we are going to move to, I believe. Thank you. Well, that, that gives me an opportunity to pass this one on to... Yeah, well, the one-liner there is, is trust is earned, and, um, and, and trust is something one freely gives, and we don't really have the mechanism for doing that right now. If all we can do is take or leave what Facebook or Google or the rest of them give us, um, we really don't have full agency. And... Uh, I would place your bets on the word agency is going to get used a lot more in the coming years. Uh, that's the, the, the power each of us has to act with full effect in the world. Um, mass surveillance or any kind of surveillance is simply not okay. Um, the, the manners behind um, following people around are, are just contemptible and uh, on their face, and, we sh and we're right to rebel against that. We're right to resist it. There, study after study uh, have been done. We did it with uh, an organization we have called Customer Commons. Uh, the, the Pew people have done it. The trustee people have done it. They show that 90% or more people don't trust others to guard their privacy, the, the companies and the institutions they're dealing with on the web and on the internet. And that mistrust has been well earned. Just the fact that you can follow people, you could put cookies in their browsers and tracking beacons on them, something that we would never allow in the physical world. Nobody would allow somebody to plant a tracking beacon inside your clothes in order to report back to them your activities so they can give you a better advertising experience. Nobody would tolerate that in the physical world, and we need to not tolerate that in the, in, in the online world. But we have to these around. Them, we are, so, so an interesting thing happened, if you give me just a, another minute. I, when you just about, referred to the tracking devices we all carry. Yeah, well, and, and, and they're, exactly, and, and, and we carry them willingly, because what, other, what else can we do? Because everybody needs a rectangle now. You know, we all have to have one. And, and, but, but here's an interesting thing that happened. So um, whenever you wanted to illustrate the Internet, which is not illustratable, okay, it's like, give us an illustration of the universe. You can't do it, right? So, so in PowerPoint, there's this little thing that looks like a cloud. And so every time somebody wanted to show the internet, they would show this cloud. And so what happened is that companies decided, wait a minute, we're going to have clouds of our own. We're going to, and everybody's going to have their little internet. And Wendy's talked a fair amount about this. We've seen a kind of contraction of the internet into this, this, this balkanization of these clouds, which by design are vague. And Apple has done a, a, a wonderful job of making completely unclear what's where. Is it in the cloud? Is it here or not? And, in New York, I'm, I have uh, iTunes Match, and I'm listening to my music. It's my music. I bought it, right? I go in the subway. I can't get it anymore all of a sudden because I've lost a connection. I was really listening to the cloud, but you don't know it's in the cloud or not. And that needs to be... Not only does that need to be disambiguated, it won't be disambiguated unless we have the agency to say, this is ours. I'm going to draw a line. This is what's private, and that's what's not. There are so many threads in there, and I imagine as your clients find them so hard to disentangle. 
Incredibly hard to disentangle, um, fortunately, maybe for a consultancy company. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I think I, I like to look at it as uh, a comparison to cars. You know, we, when cars were first invented, most of them didn't have windscreens. You know, they didn't have indicators. We didn't have roads and we didn't have <laughs> roundabouts. We certainly didn't have traffic lights. No, no fuel stations, gas stations, um, you know, all the, no MOTs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And people got in them and they died. But they also got in them and went places they could never go before. And I think, you know, in those instances, you could actually see the harm that was happening to people. Here, we can't, it's difficult to see the harm. But I see right now we're in a place which is those early days of cars. And we still have to invent... The rules, the regulations, the norms that, that wrap around all of that that enable us to, to, to do this more safely. And, and, the, and the difficulty here is, I think, the pace at which this is happening and whether or not we can actually see the harms that are going on. And, but, but if we just think about all of those things, you can start to see how actually we need to pin it all together. Whether there's a trust revolution needed, I don't know. Um, I think there's a revolution everywhere <laughs> needed. Uh, everything's going to turn upside down and um, and the web is going to be the main thing that's going to drive that, I think. That's interesting you say the web's going to drive it. I mean, Nigel, do, do you agree that the web will remain the centre of our experience here? <clears throat> well, I think two things. Well, um, one of the most interesting and uh, pieces of web science work actually probably in the 10 years, some work I did with Danny Weitzner, actually one of the other um, uh, co-founders. Um, and we had a piece of work called Privacy Bridges, which is actually trying to look at how in the absence and worry around um, um, safe harbor uh, agreements, um, the uh, Europeans and the Americans could still continue to allow uh, the trade in data. I mean, literally at the level of both personal protection, but also uh, commercial work. Now, the interesting thing about all of that is that one the recommendations that were coming out, the amazing thing was actually just a clash of cultures between Anglo-Saxon case law and normative civil law codes. And actually, that's a really interesting tension that you often come across in much of the work on legislative and regulative notions of the web is what code of law are you thinking about here? Really quite interesting questions. But the, the thing that came through on all of that was... Um, it came up to user control. Uh, and one of our recommendations was user control. A Facebook are thinking about user control. Google have aspects of it. But what does it really mean? It means, to kind of come back to earlier points, that you have to think about re-decentralizing the web. And this is actually um, um, uh, putting the data back at the edge. Why does it have to go to the center? Uh, Crider's law, just as powerful, possibly more exponentially increasing than even Moore's law, gives me more storage density, more power on these devices every 18 months. I can carry my personal uh, records. I can carry all my music. I can carry huge amounts of relevant um, self-determined personal data. And the trick will be um, how we factor that in uh, to new models, whether there'll be new disruptions that will come along both from a standards point of view, a technology point of view. I think there will be. I think it's still early days. We're still shaping this space. And I think actually the algorithm, you talk about machine learning, I think big data analytics, machine algorithms, they will help because actually there will be an appeal for algorithmic accountability. People will want to know, well, how was the decision made? And what we do know is that organizations like the Federal Trade Commission in the US, they have teeth. They sit there and worry about unfair and deceptive practices. And if you're being given a product or discriminated against on the, back, on the basis of some background information, um, they can take action. And I think the Europeans are great about talking about this stuff, but actually remedy is not always in, in the regime. So I think that we will begin to shape a world in which there's a better deal between a consumer and a citizen and the government and the corporation. And that asymmetry is something I think that we all need to think about embracing. Thank you. So, so if I can turn now, now to Matt. Uh, uh, just to continue the Monty Python theme, it's not the cloud, it's just a very naughty technology. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, um, I mean, I think it's always interesting to ask is, you know, how many people here actually understand what the cloud is? Yeah, so I'd, I'd probably say I don't understand what that word means anymore. Because people stick labels on it. You, know, get a, you can get a little box with some RAID array drives, stick them on your home router, and you can have a personal cloud. So, you know, when I'm talking about the cloud in respect to what we're doing here, 
I'm actually talking about probably four to five billion dollars of investment per quarter in physical machinery, hardware, and research and development. You know, it's incredibly physical. Um, you know, we measure our data centers in megawatts. Uh, you know, I think we've now got sort of 50 or 60 percent. Um, I need to check the current statistics on renewable. We've been sort of carbon neutral since uh, probably seven or eight years now. Now, that's because power is a major input to what we do. So, you know, when we're talking about something like the cloud, it's not like a cloud. It's not ephemeral. It's heavy duty stuff. And I think it was interesting what Nigel was saying is, well, you know, why do we take all the data to the center? I, I, the reason people have done that over time is because, you know, it's about reliability in many cases. You know, when we're looking after data, we will literally replicate that in six, seven, or eight locations. Because when you've got as many hard drives as we are, they fail all the time. Multiple times a minute, you've got machine failures. Okay, I, and, I and appreciate is, the point about the investment, but so, to get to the point about trust. So, so but it, this, is, this is my point here. You know, the reason you go is there's some very good raw economic reasons which are driving this change. However, Nigel's point still stands. How do we retain our trust? And um, some of the cutting-edge pieces of work we've been doing with our customers, particularly in things like financial services, um, is, I mean, fundamentally, everything in Google is encrypted to start with. But we don't hold the keys to it. We let the customers hold the keys so that the data and the compute, everything, we will do the computing, but we actually have no access to the keys to, those, to that data. And that's really one of these key things about how trust mm. is held back without losing the benefits of the scale and the economics. Thank you. That, I think that, that, that's a really important uh, point to make, that you can, ar you can build system architectures that will preserve yep. trust even in a cloud-based yep. world. Thank you. Um, I'd like now to invite those of you who are physically present to participate. Uh, the traditional way is to raise your hand, but the visibility in this room is very poor, so let's try hard. OK, you were first, sir, with the beard. OK, I realize that's not very distinguishing in this room. Um, but there's a microphone on its way to you, if you could. Uh, oh. And it will and, work. Uh, it's on. OK, great. Um, oh. Hi, everyone. Uh, Bernie Hogan, Oxford. My name tag is gone. So if you see it, uh, it's me. Impersonate him. Yep. You might get free coffee. I, uh, some really excellent points here. I, what I want to do is ask about what I'd consider the ideology of machine learning. And that ideology is operational is not operationalization is not a compromise, it's a virtue. Oh, we operationalized something, which means we took a bunch of squishy things and pushed them into square boxes. Then, once things are operationalized, we, uh, we expect more of them. And the idea is that more data is better because it allows machines to do this more effectively. I don't think we're going to have some sort of trust in these systems as long as we continue on a path of continued operationalization and continue more data is better for more effective control. Because it's just going to mean less user control. It's going to mean more prediction algorithms for more effectiveness in an asymmetric way. As in somebody is going to be more effective, but I am not necessarily going to be more effective. Now that value proposition raises both of us, but it doesn't raise me as fast as it raises the other one. And so I, I think that unless we uh, continue on another path or try to think of other ways, better, um, better interfaces, for example, more feedback, more decentralization, we're simply not going to have trust in the web because all it means is more data is better for you and slightly better for me. Thank you for that. Can I ask you, Doc, to take that one first? Yeah, a, a, a couple of things. I think there's a, it's fallacious that the most data is the best data, and that's, that's an assumption, I think, that's behind your oper operationalization yeah. point. Um, I, I think there's another problem, which is that probably most of that data is being collected for the single purpose of throwing ads at us. <laughs> and we don't want that. We have the largest boycott in human history right now with ad blocking, which most uh, of those who are perpetrating it are busy rationalizing away and saying, oh, you're stealing our whatever. But that's a vote on the part of people to, to, that says stop it. And a, and a big reason, if you look at the rise in ad blocking, it, abs it tracks right along with the rise in searches for the, word, for the words um, uh, retar excuse me, retargeting, which is the most obvious form of tra uh, uh, evidence of tracking, where, where you're stalked from site to site with an ad for shoes or whatever else it might be. Um, 
but I'd like to shift the point to something else. The, the, the assumption is al always that the bigger the data center we can make, uh, what, what Matt's business is, which is fine uh, for what it does, but it's an industrial system and it's an industrial model and it assumes that all agency is going to lie primarily on on the side of the people who can afford these giant things. It is exactly like the mainframe system was 40 years ago. The assumption was the bigger the computer you have, the better off you're going to be. Then personal computing came along, and what personal computing said was, you know what, we can do more with data than they can. I mean, we can do more with computing than they can. That's what personal computing was about. And the interesting thing is, we can actually do more with our own data than anybody else can, because our data is our lives. And we haven't been given the ways to do that yet. There's this assumption that's an industrial assumption, and it's an, an industrial model that the enterprise can always do more with the data than we can. But we can actually do more. We just haven't been given the tools yet. Thank, thank you for that. Do you want to pick up on any aspect <coughs> of that, Liz? Yeah, and I mean, I agree totally with what Doc says, but I think I'd just, just throw a, a chunk of um, hope into the conversation. <clears throat> We're working with a great company called Suncorp Group in, in Australia. And other than the 6.30 in the morning telephone calls, which are a bit wearying, um, th they are awesome to work with. And they have seriously grasped at a strategic level the issues that we're all talking about. And they look at it from um, a an end to the asymmetry of data. So they are seeing the en end to the asymmetry of data. And that's because consumer opinion is starting to draw them into the, the fact that they're not going to be able to do it and get away with it and still have a trusted brand. And because legislation is forcing some of that data out into the, into the open, and indeed across our societies, we're creating deliberately more transparency in our, the way we govern ourselves, the way we use data, information and services. So they are specifically looking at the end of asymmetry. And when you think that they're mostly an insurance company, if you look at insurance, insurance operates on the asymmetry of data. They know when I'm going to die, which is why when I take out life insurance, they win. They have more information so they can make that decision. Once we all have that information and the ability to compute it and actually work out when I'm going to die, a bit depressing possibly, but at least then I can, we, that, that insurance policy, that, that insurance business model no longer works. Now, okay, so now let's take that to pieces and go, what does that mean? That means our pensions don't work anymore, by the way. That means we can't insure ourselves anymore. What does that mean for our society? You start to pull that thread and it starts to unravel. But these are the challenges that Suncorp are really grasping right now with things like looking at if they've got data about me, where I live, and, and flood data, maybe they can work out whether I'm going to get flooded. And instead of taking my money and insuring my carpets when they all get flooded, they put flood defences in instead. So they get ahead of the game rather than behind the game. It's a different business model. It's a different way of working, and it's a completely more respectful um, and uh, engaging um, approach. Thank you. I, I, I like that word, respectful. I hope it, it addresses some, some of the issues. We had a question here at the front. Thank you. Uh, thank you. More a point, actually. Okay, um, make a point. I'm Mickey Yates. I, uh, I'm at the University of Leeds Data Center, but also used to work for Dunhumby, the club called people. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> it's really a point about individual data. We have it on these things. Google doesn't have what I've got and never will. Neither will Facebook. Picking up what Doc says, we have access to the information, we don't know how to use it. The one thing I learned at Dunhumby was that it's an exchange. I will give you data on my shopping, and in return I'll get special deals or better stores or whatever. And it's an exchange. And it was clear and it was transparent. But the exchanges we have now are not clear and transparent. The government makes it worse. What we need is kite marks. I will only use your data for this, I will not use it for that. So people are clear. It's an education process. I think, as well. I, did, I call this the privacy paradox because we all want ever more personalized <coughs> services. We can only get it by providing data. We haven't yet learned how to manage that paradox, but I think the end point I'm trying to make here is it's about education. Education of individuals, and frankly, education of companies that ought to know better. They're not about storing data, about helping people make their lives better. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I will take that as a point. I'll take the hand that was up over here on the uh, far left, and then you. So there's somebody around there, and then somebody here, and but we'll go for you first. I know, there's interest. Uh, thanks very much. I'm Amanda Long from Consumers International, and I'm thrilled to hear the panel talk about 
the need for a new business between consumers, business and government, because that's basically, uh, Consumers International is a federation of uh, more than 200 consumer groups from 120 countries around the world. And I just wanted to raise, Liz, I liked your point about car safety and, uh, and the fact that we're talking about a whole situation that, that, that needs a framework put on it. It was consumer groups. In fact, our largest member consumer report set up by Ralph Nader in the States that actually began the framework of car safety in the world. So I think that what's key in this is consumer or user, however you wish to say it. I know Doc has a view on that, and rightly so. <laughs> um, not going to argue with you, Doc. But at the end of the day, it, it will be the consumer voice or the user voice that needs to drive this change. And it's that engagement that we need to work on. Thanks. Uh. Thank you for that. And I, uh, Wendy wants to yeah, I make a point. I just want to say, I mean, I know Doc does have very strong views on this. And I actually do agree with him. I, because we aren't just consumers in this. We are prosumers, right? We create content. And that is so important in this world. And whilst I, I agree with the principles, I think the, use, the rhetoric must be about us being part of the machine. Right? We are not just consuming. We are actually producing as well. We, we, we consume, we produce. It's all, I mean, actually, I quite like to ask Nigel about this because it does come back to the point about web science is an attempt to understand online behaviours in a way that allows predictions to be made, that allows analysis, so that everybody can be empowered by this. Forecasts, not predictions. Forecasts, not predictions, apparently. <laughs> is this like recommendations, not standards? A nice little slate of hand. <laughs> and your question is... <laughs> <laughs> My question is, how important is it to understand the web as a social machine in order to be an empowered consumer? Uh, well, I, so the web as a social machine. Yeah, given that we are social machines, this kind of assembly of uh, people at scale, algorithms at scale, and data at scale, what are their emergent properties? I mean, it's kind of like a first-order web science question. And, of course, in lots of areas, that is precisely... The, the, the business model, you know, so whether it's the recommender engines, whether it's the kind of uh, sense of how to kind of get uh, uh, homophilic uh, uh, um, uh, social networks where there's kind of support groups, uh, the kind of network analysis, the network science that is so much a part of what we do. Yeah, it is about understanding that. I would think that we've also, when we do that, I mean, I think there will be a really interesting conversation that we'll be having both, uh, again, with our governments and our, and our large uh, internet providers who, by the way, do extraordinary things, I would just say that, but the, 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 the barrier to entry of having to spend $4 billion a year is a significant one. So the question then is, what's the kind of quid pro quo here? And it will be around things like um, public good around data. So data as infrastructure. So if, um, if Google's going to take all that great Wikipedia data and put it into their knowledge panels and clean it up and edit it, what about putting it back out there as open data? Um, what about the situation where Apple uh, um, um, Health Kit is collecting all this information? Uh, what about routinely making it available to the individual whose data it is? So these new kind of uh, relationships will have to be at the heart of it. And one of them that web science is concerned about are the new kinds of research compact we can have with GAFA, with the Google, Apples, Facebooks, Amazons, and uh, Ebays, about how we can get access at scale collectively to certain sorts of data to help do the web science research. And at the moment, we're making do on the scraps from the table that we can see in the open source domain. So, so a move to, to have much more open access in controlled circumstances, yeah, yeah, obviously. Sure, yeah. yeah, it would need to be, would need to be, it would need to be that. But it is, again, it, it, is, it is because so much of the action, and of course there are bilateral deals, there's lots of research collaborations between individual institutions, but there's something around, um, and again, the Google Labs is a great ex example, I think, of what could be achieved in these kinds of spaces where you have an understanding of what is available. Now, the... The danger in all of that, of course, is at the precise moment at which you're able to do some really impressive things, people just see how much triangulation there is in all of this data, and, and, and there will be. And so then the question, back to Doc's original point, is how do we engineer privacy such that they recognize just because the information is there does not mean you can use it against me or to inform a decision against me. So we put around a set of social norms or regulations or laws which... Uh, which do keep us safe in the age of, um, of, of, of a social machine which has both extraordinary uh, analytic, predictive, and also um, oversight powers. Thank you. Does anyone else want to pick up on that? Should I 
Do you know, there's briefly. one thing that I've been noodling for quite some time, and that is the need for what I call crash test dummies in this world. So we need, we need a way so that we can... Crash test dummies are now collaborative devices which monitor everything that's going on when crashes happen, etc. We need a way of using real live data to, to, to trust, to work out what happens to people. Uh, there's an awful lot of thought about what might happen and what might be good or might be bad. A lot of fear, uncertainty and doubt. Let's look, work out what the real harms are. And then let's work out how to fix them and make that open so that everybody can work at, at fixing them. And I, I think that's part of what you're talking about, Nigel, which is, you know, creating an environment. Do you remember when we did the My Data Hackathon? Mm. And, and, get it, and I remember getting all my data out personally. It took me we weeks. <laughs> but, you know, that data, getting real data in there is, is an essential element. OK, so volunteers for Crash Test Dummy, <laughs> uh, please <laughs> sign up later. I'm afraid we're going to go for this Chris. last question here because you had your hand up a long time. There's a lot of hands up, sorry. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Eva Pasco. I've been the uh, lucky co-founder of the first uh, internet cafe back in 1994. Uh, I think many of you came to learn email with us. So a while of watching the web. Uh, but really a question for, for Liz. I think trust probably is more of a two-way story. So trust from consumer to the web but also our trust as web community in the consumer. Because over the last two years, the market has taken a lot of steps forward to reassure the consumer. So a good example would be Shopify, which has worked out that small merchants are absolutely incapable of holding on to credit cards safely. Mm. So Shopify took it away and does not allow small retailer hold the data. And the consumers, which I'm hearing are getting more and more sussed about this. I'm, gonna, I'm happy to shop from a shop which is on Shopify because I know their data is in good hands. I'm not so happy to show in some rubbish WooCommerce or Old Magento held under the carpet. So, so that knowledge is becoming to leak through and it's just giving more of that knowledge to people through the kite marks and through the understanding. So I think it's a, it's a two-way story. The digital bill of rights which we're working on it's assuming people will learn. You have to give people the benefit of the doubt and trust. Uh, so how can we help the industry to respond to the problems quicker and let that trust flow both ways? Thank you, Eva. So um, I'm, I'm completely stealing something that Nigel kicked off with the My Data program, which is we're all after a race to the top here, which is you know once businesses start to be trusted, like you've just spoken about, Consumers will migrate to those, those businesses and others will be left behind. And my God, you'd be careful if you get left behind in this one. And it is going to be a race to the top. I, I'm not sure about the education thing or the bringing people along. I think people will go where they know they can, be, they can find trust and they can operate and create value in their lives. And, and that is going to be where businesses shall, shall go. Doc, can we rely on the market to fix it, which is what we seem to be hearing there? <laughs> yeah, actually, a, a, a couple of points there. One is that... One of the things we discovered in our work is that small business and individuals actually have a lot in common. Uh, they both feel very much, um, and there's some nods in the room, that's cool, um, uh, put upon in, in more or less similar ways. I know we have another one, it's a shaking, shaking head over there. Um, uh, but again, it's still early. And, and when we speak about the market, I, we have to speak about individuals in it. And we haven't equipped people yet to, to have as much choice as they could have. And when we do, it's going to be a very different story, I think. And, and it'll follow exactly what Liz was talking about. When, we're, when we have full control over, over our data, I mean, there's a, a wonderful thing done by Kim Cameron at Microsoft. He's the head of their identity um, uh, initiative. And he had the seven laws of identity. And it had things like um, use, user control and consent, limited disclosure for constrained use, justifiable parties, very sensible stuff. And it took, it took Microsoft a long time to realize that they can't run the whole show. Hmm. And what they've done by obeying the laws that he came up with is they're running a lot of the show. Um, and it, took, it was a long learning process in the, pro, in, in the course of that. Um, but what happened is their, their users actually taught them a lot. And that's a lot of what Kim ran with that. And I think we're going to see you know, smart companies respecting people and dumb companies not. And, Thank they'll you. pay the consequences. Matt, you're a smart company. You respect people? Yes. 
I mean, I could only I can only reiterate what the pan, what the panel said is, uh, um, you know, trust is trust is earned hard way, and um, and it's something you have to be ever vigilant about. Uh, uh, so it, it, that's the core of it. Everything. Thank you. And and Wendy, just as we finish, as we as, as we close now, Ava raised the digital bill of rights, which is something I know she's been working on for many years. Trust surely is embedded within a broader framework of how we regulate this this information environment we find ourselves in. Uh, very interesting. We're running short of time. I just want to make the analogy with the way we, um, it, over history, have trusted the banks with our money. Um, and uh, that all got a very complicated system. And how do we trust them? But we did actually take the, we, it back in the day. Uh, people took the, the trusted the banks to put their physical money into and look after it. And I think we, that's the where we are in the world today. We we have got to decide where we're going to put this this our physical data and uh, not our physical our virtual data <laughs> assets uh, and tr who we're going to trust to look after it because I don't think we can trust ourselves if we are the first party contract do you want to go to in what ways do we can we not trust ourselves surely, surely we have to trust ourselves yeah but most of us aren't literate enough to be able to I mean uh, look at me and my phone I couldn't turn it off let alone think <laughs> about where my data is I don't trust myself and I'm a professor of computer science and on that bombshell and on <laughs> And on, on that note, I all of us, I, I, uh -oh. I, I, don't, I don't think we can do better than that, that we have built systems that have embedded within them such dark patterns that even one of the world's most profoundly talented and skilled professors of computer science is occasionally defeated by them. <laughs> and so despite our conversation around particularly the ideas of agency, of a need for symmetry and crucially of respect on all parts to ensure that the potential of the web is actually delivered to all of us. We need to recognize that at some point we interact with those systems unless the designers and developers of those systems embed those principles in their practice, not even the best regulation will save us. And on that note, I'd like to thank my distinguished panel, Wendy Hall, Nigel Shadbolt, Doc Searles, Lee Brandt, and Mac McNeil, and call proceedings to a close. Thank you for watching online. Stay with us in the room. Thank you.